thinking of doing the meeting in Pennsylvania. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I like Pennsylvania. I can go there. But in terms of my involvement, I might be a little bit limited in you know, uh, resources and so forth and how much I can put into the meeting. And so I suggested, you know, why not Virginia? And he thought about it and he said, well, the Mississippi Basin panel is the group that was sort of wanting to see this come to fruition. And Virginia's kind of far from the, and we thought, well, wait a minute though. There's a tiny little piece of Virginia that does drain that way. <laughs> and we have the Virginia chapter of the American Fishery Society. It's a very vibrant body of, of uh, hardworking people and professionals. And, and we needed that, that support, that backbone to try to pull this thing off. And so the more we thought about it and talked about it, I said, okay, I think we can do this in Virginia. So essentially a year and a half, we've got the Mississippi Basin panel as the, the primary uh, emphasis behind this. And I think Dwayne might expand on that a little bit more, how this came to be. We've got the Mid-Atlantic panel, another sponsor of this meeting, the Aquatic Invasive Species. We've got my agency, even though the Virginia chapter of American Fishery Society is sort of shepherding this thing and, and hosting it and sponsoring it, but the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, many of us with the Virginia chapter are sort of in um, both different groups, of course, and, and they are a sponsor as well, uh, and Dominion Power. So we've, we've been able to put together, uh, I hopefully, a pretty good template for you all. I think the idea was to try to bring the most knowledge about snakeheads together in one place at one time to sort of uh, disseminate that information. The proceedings will be coming out. I would like to ask folks that are gonna publish to try to get their manuscripts into me by, uh, into me and Dwayne by uh, October 1st, uh, a few months down the road. Hopefully we can, uh, we don't wanna sit on it too long, uh, get it out since it's sort of a timely thing. Couple announcements. Uh, some of you all went down and hit the break down the, down the pike there. That's not our food. Our, we'll have some snacks at uh, <laughs> our first break. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, po the poster session will be, I think what we, last night was a, a terrible weather night. Tonight should be a really nice weather night, especially for D.C. in July. So we're going to hopefully be in the courtyard right behind the wall there. And we are going to have some heavy hors d'oeuvres, including about 50 pounds of fresh snakehead that we supplied the hotel with. And the chefs are going to prepare that a bunch of different ways. So for those of you that haven't had the pleasure of trying snakehead, we will be enjoying some of that tonight. Um, and I think oh, the, and the poster presentation is sort of in tag team with, with that social, although we have decided to put the posters in the break room as well to try to maximize exposure. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to, to Mr. Dwayne Chapman and see if uh, he can enlighten us a little bit further on how we got here. Um, this did sort of start in my committee with the Mississippi River Basin Panel on Aquatic Nuisance Species. And uh, then I, I, you know, it didn't take me too long to figure out who probably would be, the, I think, the right person to, to really to do this thing, which was John. And I, so I, we, uh, you know, we looked like we had some funding for it. And uh, I, so I called up John and uh, again, and I said, uh, John, there's this, uh, we have this idea that this really needs to be done. We kind of want to pattern it after the Asian carp thing. And I've been through this rodeo a couple of times previously. So I said, uh, John, here's the deal. Uh, I would, uh, we can uh, do this thing, but you're going to have to do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what's happened here. Um, you know, I've been there because I've been, like I said, this is not my first ro rodeo. I've been here for helping a little bit. But every all the work that you see here uh, is by comes from John and his crew that put on this uh, this thing. So th there's a man you want to you want to thank for for uh, for all this stuff. Um, and uh, and MRBP is happy to to work with the other sponsors of this thing and get this on the road. And in a, in a, in a, I think we've got a really good good uh, symposium plan for you guys. And I think you're going to really enjoy it. And, we, and I, I again I do encourage the authors to make sure you get your stuff in in a timely fashion. We want to do a little quicker than I did with the Asian carp uh, book. So the uh, um, only other thing I've got to add is, is uh, have a good time while you're here in, in, in uh, Virginia and, and enjoy this conference because I, I do think we have some great science ahead of us for you. Okay, what I'll do is I'll introduce the first moderator for the first session. But speaking of hard work, I do want to give a particular shout out to a member of the Virginia chapter, American Fishery Society, that I relied on heavily. Um, pretty much every step of the way was instrumental in setting up our announcements, our registration page. Almost anything I needed, I asked him to do it, and he did it immediately with almost uh, no feedback. Uh, hey, Kim, 
and by the way, uh, a promising graduate student <laughs> needs funding for a snakehead study. So uh, and anybody sitting on a little cash, a little pot of money, um, Ms. Henderson, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Possibly, uh, anyway, thank you very much, hey, for all your hard work. And uh, without further ado, I want to do Dan Wilson. I think he's moderating the first session. Thank you. All right, contrary to um, your schedule, we did have to do some rearrangements. Um, we had a introductory talk to start with to kind of head, head everything up and give a good overview of everything and unfortunately with travel and um, planes and all that one is delayed so we are moving the first presentation that's on your list um, later on and replacing it with our our first speaker and that would be Dr. Joe Love and he is from Maryland, where's Joe? Okay, um, Maryland DNR and Joe, what's your title? Welcome, and sorry you had to lead things off. I know you weren't anticipating it, but I know you'll do a good job. Well, we don't know that. Hopefully, hopefully we'll see. Um, thank you, John. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity to talk about snakehead research, and uh, I'm really happy to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done in Maryland, uh, particularly with our control program. So I've co-authored this with Paul Genovese, who works with our Office of Communications. He's been really important in kind of conceptualizing and driving our progress in, uh, in our control work. Okay. So. Oh, perfect. All right. So some of you guys uh, may know about the problem we had with snakeheads in Maryland. It began in uh, the early 2000s. We ended up with uh, some snakeheads in Crofton Pond. Crofton is a town in Maryland, and there are a series of ponds associated with it. It's kind of an urban area. And the department was very concerned about uh, the spread of snakeheads from the Crofton Ponds into the Patuxent River, and then from the Patuxent into the Potomac. They were very concerned that it would enter into the Chesapeake Bay. So this is sort of the timeline I've pieced together of the Crofton Pond incident in the early 2000s. In 2000, fish were legally purchased from New York, but they were illegally released into the ponds in Crofton, Maryland. Uh, not long after, in 2002, someone actually caught a snakehead and photographed it and released it. That photo made it to a, a hairstylist in that shop and then that made it to the wife of my former boss and then my former boss identified that as a snakehead. So shortly thereafter, we began working with Fish and Wildlife Service to determine just how pro, uh, you know, prolific or how many snakeheads were in the pond. Turns out to be a few of them. And so later that fall, they applied rotenone to the pond to basically suffocate the fish at the cost of about $110,000. And then um, that eradicated the snakehead from those ponds in Crofton. In 2003, Fish and Wildlife got it listed as injurious uh, wildlife, largely because we learned that they could proliferate well in our temperate waters, and uh, Maryland began uh, working toward legislation preventing live possession. Unfortunately, snakeheads made it into the Potomac River anyway about that time in the early 2000s, and um, it's likely that they were repeatedly introduced into the Anacostia River, perhaps Kenilworth Gardens, at least based on the genetics work Tim King with USGS has done. Uh, since that time, they were caught in 2004 in Virginia waters and then later that year in Maryland. Our surveys began, our uh, boat electrofishing surveys for tidal bass, uh, largemouth bass, began picking them up in 2006. Uh, so this lower graph here, I don't know if there's a, a pointer. Yep, this lower graph here 
is a chart of the proportion of sites where we began picking up snakeheads versus time. As you can see, it's increased, and right now we're picking them up anywhere between 20 and 40 percent of the sites that we surveyed in tidal freshwater on the Potomac. Um, we began landing snakehead a year later in 2007, and our catch per hour began increasing until 2012. Uh, and, and it was a good sign after 2012, we started seeing a reduction and for three years, catch per hour was low, but unfortunately in the past two years, our catch per hours are about what we saw in 2012. So, the, so relative abundance has increased. So in general, we're seeing them at 20 to 40 percent of the sites on the Potomac River at about an average of 30 fish per hour sampled. Uh, that's not the end of the story. Unfortunately, snakeheads did make it out of the Potomac River. They got into uh, the Patuxent River, and they have made it into the Patapsco. They navigated their way up the bay to the head of the Chesapeake Bay. Now they've moved up the fish lift over Conowingo Dam and are likely in Conowingo Reservoir right now. They were also introduced into the Delaware, so into Delaware where they have spread out on the eastern shore and have done quite nice, uh, better on than on the Potomac in some of our rivers on the eastern shore of Maryland. We documented the spread using data from USGS's non-indigenous aquatic species database and documented the spread within the watershed, uh, across sub-watersheds within Chesapeake Bay. We see this nice increase in the number of newly colonized sub-watersheds with a plateau around that 2012 period. We documented that it's related to precipitation, which is not unlike work done with telemetry and snakeheads, so basically spring rains tend to elicit that type of movement for snakeheads. This is a, this is a map of that watershed of Chesapeake Bay, and as you can see um, by the red dots, they're not everywhere within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. There are some limitations. We're not sure about the suitable habitat for the species yet. We will learn more about how they respond to first and second order streams soon. They are in trout waters. We do know that they do fine in non-tidal impoundments. There are some invasive properties of snakehead, including their general tolerances for habitat preferences. Um, they also have a high reproductive capacity, so it was warranted that they were listed as injurious wildlife as well as um, limited by live possession in, in the mid-Atlantic states. Uh, ecologically, there are negative impacts. I know we will discuss a little bit about this today. I've got a poster on this as well. Uh, they do prey upon a lot of different aquatic species, aquatic species in North America, a lot of different types, and uh, we have seen them starting to eat ducks and small mammals, particularly on the eastern shore. Um, so that's unfortunate. They're also utilizing space that our North American aquatic fishes could be otherwise using. They do co-occur with some of our freshwater top predators. And there are some fishing negative impacts as well. Some people enjoy fishing for them, but it's a very small fishery. And one guy on the eastern shore lost his thumb because he couldn't de-hook the snakehead fast enough. So, I mean, there's some serious issues here that we're trying to deal with in terms of education and and allowing, you know, telling people how to handle the species. So we took a pr uh, three-prong approach to dealing with snakeheads in terms of a state response. We were somewhat proactive. We didn't r wait for all the science to come out before we started addressing the issue. And we began addressing the issue with enforcement, education, and encouraging harvest. We knew that if we were going to encourage harvest, that we would need to saddle that approach with the invasibility of the species, because otherwise this encouragement would lead to a different direction than where the state wanted to go. So enforcement has been ramped up. Every year we talk with Natural Resource Police. The fines are now at $1,000 per fish, up to $2,500 per fish, up to $25,000 per case. So if someone's holding 10 live snakehead, they could be fined $25,000. There are pending cases. Natural Resource Police have knocked on the doors of individuals. They've shut down Facebook pages, and they have fined people. So they are taking this serious, and I'm happy about that because we're trying to protect not only Maryland, but the mid-Atlantic area as well as the continental United States. There are some reasons for live possession. Food fish is one of them. We're trying to work with people on how to kill the species because we don't want them to be in violation of law. 
But there are a couple of other reasons. Some people don't believe that there are any negative impacts owed to snakehead, as you can see by this Facebook post. It's very common for people to say that there is zero evidence for negative impacts, but that, and that they're a fun sport fish. That just seems to be justification for live possession and wanting to stock them in other areas in Maryland. We have seen Facebook posts of people trying to sell young snakehead as well. And like I said, our Natural Resource Police has shut at least one individual down from that. We're hoping that that kind of uh, that feedback on Facebook stops. So we are working toward an education campaign to convince people that, you know, snakeheads don't belong in North America. And we're doing that through videos. We have a video online, and it's been actually kind of popular uh, for a few years now. But we are revamping that video with some updated content to decisively demonstrate and tell why it's a problem to hold these snakeheads. We have website content that's similar to what Virginia has. We also have some information in our aquatic nuisance species plan that's used mainly for policymakers, similar to Virginia's ANS plan as well. And we're conducting studies. We have uh, numerous uh, studies to address the issue of snakeheads, and one of those studies addresses negative impacts, and I have a poster on that later on today. Uh, we began encouraging harvest and that, you know, saddling that with all that education component. And we started in 2011 uh, with an angler's law campaign. We had a lot of people who didn't want to touch a snakehead, who didn't want to catch a snakehead, and didn't want to harvest a snakehead. And we knew if we were going to actually do something about this problem, we had to mobilize anglers. And we knew that people can overfish a species because I've seen it. We've all seen it as fishery scientists, so this is nothing novel. In 2011, we began a system by which we asked anglers to kill snakeheads and tell us how they caught them. That information went live on our angler's log, and then anglers were teaching anglers how to fish for these fish and why they were a problem. We carried that out between two 2011 and 2014, and it was somewhat successful, as you can see. In 2012, we ended up with about 400 snakeheads killed and reported as part of that contest. It was a and at the end of the year, we drew out names as part of a random drawing just to kind of incentivize this because it's actually something most of our anglers don't want to do. A lot of them are catch and release. A lot of them don't want to bloody their boats. So getting them to this point was, was somewhat difficult. In 2014, we transitioned this survey to a uh, volunteer angler survey, and we stopped this contest. But that didn't mean we stopped encouraging harvest. Tempted there. There we go. Didn't mean we stopped encouraging harvest. We attended tournaments. Whack Factor Tournament on the Potomac River was one of the first ones. We went to that tournament. We talked with the anglers. We engaged the fishery, and we told them, you know, how to handle snakeheads and, and what the problem behind there was. We had an informational tournament held at CNO Canal for two years. Only one snakehead was caught at each of those events during each of those years. But we partnered with the Park Service and Fish and Wildlife Service and spread the message to about 450 people in the non-tidal Potomac, an area which is a major trout fishery as well as smallmouth bass fishery, but a whole group of people who are not used to fishing in tidal waters and fishing for snakeheads. This year, we're going to have a freedom and fishing tournament at the Harriet Tubman State Park on the eastern shore because we haven't done anything on the eastern shore yet. We have problems with snakehead over there. They're very prolific. So we're trying to spread the message over there and encourage harvest. As you can see, we have um, other ways of getting mobil mobilizing recreational anglers. We have uh, species awards that we offer to anglers who catch large fish. Well, we began including in those awards an invasive species award for individuals who kill a snakehead and report it. We would, we would give them a certificate for catching that fish. This is very, this is essentially Maryland's citation award program. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but we basically reward anglers for catching large fish. And uh, this was begun in 2014. The number of entrants now has increased, but we're only at like 20, so it's not a huge program. The, um, we do have an invasive species state record. Uh, most states have state records. We dubbed 
this aspect an invasive species state record to again marry this concept of invasiveness and um, you know the state record making it appreciate making us appreciative of these guys taking out the largest of the snakehead Dutch Baldwin is on the left our record was just broken this year by the guy on the right that's a 19.9 pound snakehead so the state the state records have actually increased um, or the size of the fish have actually increased uh, in state records since 2014 when we began starting this and as you can see in 2018 um, we're now at 19.9 we have had years when the record was broken within that same year uh, we're also engaging our commercial sector because the recreational side is wonderful but commercial fisheries help too we had it you know hall saners uh, picture there on the left catching snakeheads early on in 2004 2005 but they were just throwing the snakeheads back they were seeding the river moving them around because there's no market for them so we be we engaged our our uh, and there was nothing wrong for that except they, they weren't doing anything illegal but they weren't harvesting those fish and we wanted to try and change that mentality so we engaged our seafood marketing group to try and develop a market for snakeheads in the state of Maryland and as a result of that, Waterman began reporting and selling more snakehead over time. These are just the y-axis of just the pounds of snakehead. As you can see, the pounds sold on the Potomac River has increased. We're now at 5,000 pounds for this past year, but, you know, that's not a lot, you know. We sell millions of pounds of blue catfish from the Potomac River. So, again, we're not talking about a large fishery for snakehead. Um, so we're trying to expand that fishery a little bit, uh, the commercial side. And so a couple of years ago, we began offering a very cheap license to bow hunters who want to target snakehead and commercially sell them. Those licenses are unlimited, which is wonderful if you know about the commercial license system in Maryland. And they're only $50, which is really good because a lot of them go, you know, for 500 So, the, you know, the other commercial licenses. So here we're talking about a $50 license. For, for to engage watermen to go out target snakehead uh, with a bow and perhaps alleviate pressure on some of the other species they typical bo typically bow hunt like gar and carp. So since the inception a couple years ago, we've sold 57 licenses. Again, this is not a very large fishery, but it's something uh, that we're doing to try and um, improve the uh, the harvest numbers. So. Where are we now? Well, we know the species isn't going away. We know that it's in the river. We know that it's in the bay. It's going to continue to spread. Just this year, we've gotten new reports, Lock Raven Reservoir. Um, the species is spreading into our non-tidal waters, and we don't know how it's going to interact with our trout fisheries. It's already changing the way we're addressing trout stocking within the state because anglers don't want to see a stocking trout in areas where there are snakeheads that do eat them. We have seen that. So, um, we are concerned that they're still in the state, but we're just trying to control their biomass right now. And by doing that, we're hoping to prevent a problem with the neighboring states for P Pennsylvania, New York, or perhaps the continental United States. So we are still engaging enforcement. Uh, we're working with NRP every year. I personally meet with the commanders as well as the officers to tell them and remind them how important it is to issue fines. We are improving our education and outreach. We're developing new videos now on snakehead and informational, some driven by commercial watermen. And we're continuing to encourage harvest, uh, though we do recognize the harvest of snakehead is very low. The number of people going after snakehead is very low. Last year we did a creel survey. This is not a very big fishery on the Potomac River. So the only way we're going to get better is if we perhaps begin encouraging more people to go target them. And so with that, I'll end and take any questions. Yes, sir. Yes, so we are we are definitely seeing well so in in we have trout in third-order streams, too. They're not all in, like, headwater or first-order streams. 
So yeah, we're, we do see snakehead in areas where there are reproducing, in areas where there are trout. What we don't know is how well they're going to do in those first order streams because um, we haven't seen them there proliferate yet. So we're keeping an eye on what they're going to do in those systems. Yeah. And they're definitely reproducing in the ponds where we're stocking trout. We know that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. We know that one went up in lift because it was it was observed by the people who monitor the lift movement. So we we've worked this year with Exelon to draft a policy on that. Pennsylvania and New York were very concerned about it. So I think we've got a good strategy in place and how to handle that as an issue moving forward. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Right, so um, la two years ago, the University of Maryland worked with us uh, and Josh uh, to basically do just that. So they did a creel survey on the Potomac River in some of the locations like Matawoman Creek and asked anglers their attitude about, about snakehead. Um, you know, we also get their feedback through Facebook. We get their feedback. A Washington Post article was just printed this weekend about controlling snakehead on the Potomac and there were a lot of comments to that author. So we, we are paying attention to general general feedback through those. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, yes sir. Yeah. Yeah, I we don't have hard numbers on that because we don't keep track of how many fish are recreationally harvest harvested. Um, you know, when we did our creel, we did a creel survey last year uh, in the Potomac River and in the Upper Chesapeake Bay, and the harvest reported during that survey was much lower than, than the commercial side. Unfortunately, that survey did not document the harvest of snakehead from bow hunters who typically go out at night. So our creel clerks, and myself included, we didn't survey the boat ramps at night. So I know that we underestimated that. You know, but taking a look at what we see on the angler's log, and what I'm hearing from Blackwater of a guy going out there and catching 100 in a single day. One guy, I am certain that people are catching more than what we are representing. Yes, yes, absolutely underestimated. Any other questions? Thank you, guys. Butt in here real quick. Ask all the speakers when, since we're live streaming this and we're cataloging it for future reference. If you get a question, you don't have to repeat the exact question, but just sort of paraphrase the question um, so that it can be picked up on the mic. Thank you. Next presenter is Aaron Bunch from he's uh, locally grown here, and um, he's going to give us some information on the distribution of snakeheads in Virginia. <coughs> Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, uh, it's interesting to get together with a bunch of folks uh, spe for a specific uh, resource issue, so this is really cool stuff. I'd um, like to um, thank the co-authors on this presentation. These are all the, the biologists who have uh, come in contact with snakeheads in Virginia and provided data uh, for this presentation. Um, and I have the luxury of getting up here in one of the first presentations so I can actually uh, have some meaningful background for you guys. Uh, so as Joe alluded to earlier with the initial uh, uh, colonization in Maryland, they were first discovered in, in the Potomac in 2004. And, and over the last decade or more, as we've seen, 
they've spread into nearly the entire tidal descent system and dispersed southward into Virginia, and that's what I'm going to discuss today. Um, and, and part of the reason why we're here is, is really whenever there's an invasive species uh, and there's uncertainty surrounding that species, there's, there's cause for concern. Um, and, and we're not sure the ecos ecosystem level impacts of this fish. So that's why we're all sitting in the room today. Um, what we do know about the species, <coughs> especially during its early colonization phases, it's highly mobile. In talking with uh, Josh Neward of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, with the tagging returns that he has received, um, his fish that, were, that have moved um, up to 88 kilometers. Um, on, in the Potomac River, uh, and overall, the species has high phenotypic plasticity. And when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about physiologically, um, they they're able to survive and be tolerant of, of low dissolved oxygen. So wide ranging uh, oxygen levels, anoxia, hypoxia, air breathing ability. Uh, what surprised me is the wide range in the uh, in the temperature uh, that these fish can tolerate. Um, uh, and, and I pulled this data mostly from uh, from the National Management Plan. Um, and surprisingly, there's not a whole lot with regards to salinity, um, and, but I'm going to touch on that today. Um, and, and it's been discussed in the management plan that the salinity tolerance is up to, to 18 parts per thousand. But um, if anybody can, you know, show me some published literature about salinity, I'd be happy to see it. <coughs> So the objectives today uh, is to utilize the existing data resources we have in Virginia and document uh, new observations of northern snakehead uh, to inform distribution maps in Virginia. And I know this is done on a national scale, um, but we're, we're, we're focused, in, at least in this presentation, specific to Virginia. <coughs> so, and I'm also going to, this is kind of good intro material for you guys as far as understanding the mechanisms for dispersal and discussions of the mechanisms. Um, whether it be natural dispersal uh, or human introduction. And so we have a statewide database containing all uh, the verified observations that was used to develop this, uh, these maps and GIS. <coughs> and <coughs> we, we conduct uh, standardized electric fishing surveys all over the state. Um, uh, all of our tidal rivers we use, we conduct uh, electric fishing surveys annually, a lot of our major lakes it's conducted annually, and then some of our small impoundments and other, um, other water bodies, it's more of a, a rotational basis. So we're out there, we're sampling, we've been doing it for a long time, a lot of these studies have been going on for decades, so we're able to pick up the species and, and see its, uh, its colonization and distribution um, through time. And so I, I mentioned the, the, uh, the surveys here, but there's some other things that go into it, and that is uh, angler reports, and less so commercial fishers, but we, we have had a couple of observations from commercial aspects, but um, it's mainly, you know, into this database of roughly 5,700 records in Virginia. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at information from our uh, monitoring surveys, but also the angling public. And we, <coughs> we gather observations um, through two different uh, public reporting options. So um, <coughs> we have a, a hotline number that was started you know, back in the early 2000s or mid-2000s when this became an issue. Um, so that's, that's where most of our data has come from um, as far as the public. But a few years ago, we, we launched an online web application. Um, and you can see here, this is the the portal, it's Snakehead Citizen Science, um, and, and people can go to that uh, on, their, on their phones or whatever on the computer and enter their information. Um, you know, we get all sorts of interesting things, and, uh, you know, a lot of folks, well, not a lot, but um, will, they'll get the, the bowfin mixed up with Snakehead. Uh, the native bowfin in Virginia look, I mean, very similar. Um, we try to tell anglers to differentiate that mostly with the anal fin, the elongated anal, anal fin on the, uh, on the snakehead versus the, the bowfin. But also we have some American eel um, that, you know, that show up. And that's where, that's these spots down here. This one was a bowfin. This one was an American eel. 
This one was a, a random call of just somebody saying they might have seen one in a pond. Um, and we didn't have verification of photos to go along with that observation. So, um, but these are the data sources that we have, and this is what comes of it. So, um, this is the overall distribution map in Virginia. Um, this is the, I guess, the eastern, eastern half of Virginia. Um, it's hard to see what we're doing here. Uh, we got the Potomac River, obviously. Uh, and all the tributaries up, up and down the Potomac has been, um, uh, had observations um, further down into the watersheds, into the Chesapeake Bay, and up the Rappahannock River. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of uh, discuss this map by watershed and the mechanisms where those fish may have, uh, have entered the watershed throughout the presentation. But one thing I did do is look at <coughs> the cumulative number of verified locations in Virginia since the initial invasion. Um, and, and this is what we've seen since 2004. Um, so we've seen a, a large cumulative increase based on the database that we, that we have. Um, so, so we're still increasing as far as the number of locations in the state of Virginia. All right, so <coughs> let's talk about why, why these fish are moving. And so we're going to, you know, I'm going to focus in on some of the tributaries I've lumped it into natural dispersal colonization. Um, uh, there could be some human introductions here, but uh, this, these are largely connected waters um, that we're talking about in this situation. So Potomac River, we've had extensive and intensive uh, surveys in the Virginia Potomac tributaries. John and crew have done a lot of uh, abundance estimates and relative abundance indices in these creeks so a lot of work's been going on um, uh, and so we're seeing uh, you know distribution pattern all up and down the river so all up and down the Potomac River uh, when you go to the lo lower Potomac and downstream uh, you know we're seeing fish even you know in some of these lower tributaries um, and then what's surprising is right in here, we're seeing like Great Wacomico River here. There's a couple of mill dams. Um, so these fish are, they're, tr they're really, it's probably during dispersal and they're trying to find fresh water um, going up to these mill dams and trying to, trying to find adequate um, water quality for survival. Uh, interestingly enough, these kids up here, you know, this, this fish was, was lethargic. Uh, it, was in the l it was in one of these spots down in here. Um, you know, just swimming along the shoreline and they were able to gig it during the day, so it was probably uh, in a inhospitable salinity concentrations and, and on its way out um, as, as far as uh, being able to survive in that situation. And so, and we've seen them, you know, downstream and then, and then go up into the Rappahannock River. And this is the Rappahannock River. Uh, this is the, this is the uh, the most westerly that we have seen the species, Rapidan River and the the Thornton River. Um, this is up in the upper watershed where we're approaching um, trout. I don't I don't know if this is these aren't trout waters, right, John? But we're approaching trout waters, um, and we're getting into this these upper um, upper locations. And then you can see how um, you know. We do have detections in the middle part of the, the river as well. Um, in the lower tidal area, which is, which is my focal area, um, we've seen an increase. We first picked them up in, in 2012, um, and they've, they've increased the number of sites that they've, they've occupied pretty rapidly in that section of the river. And so there's a small drainage called the Piankatank River. Uh, Dragon Run Swamp runs and, and creates the, the Piankatank River. This is just below the mouth of the Rappahannock. It's one of the most undeveloped watersheds in the state, beautiful place. Um, and the fish were first picked up beginning in 2013, uh, but <coughs> we have not seen um, rapid population growth in this specific river. It's likely associated with the productivity of the river. It's not a very productive uh, little system. So, so why is this? You know, uh, Joe just discussed, um, you know, spring, wet springs um, in some of the upper watersheds. 
uh, within the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and so this is the predicted uh, Chesapeake Bay salinity. You know, so when you're approaching the Chesapeake Bay mouth, it obviously gets a lot saltier. Um, and so uh, these are maps created by PhD candidate Vaskar Nepal with the data from Du and Shin from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And what you see here is the average uh, salinity, uh, predicted salinity gradient in a dry year and a, in a wet year. Um, dry year, wet year, during fall and during spring. And so you can see this is a predictive model of salinity over you know, a few decades of data. And this is um, blue catfish salinity tolerance data that Vascar um, uh, has worked with. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that northern snakeheads are identical in their salinity tolerance to blue catfish, but we could use this as a potential model or at least a way to, uh, to think about how we could look at northern snakehead in the future. Um, and so what he's done is he's looked at the 72-hour lethal concentration, 50% mortality, using a logistic regression model and applied that to the salinity gradient. And that's what you have here with this 0 to 1 as uh, solely based on salinity, no other habitat variables, um, the, the ability for a blue catfish to live in different salinity regimes within the bay. Um, and so let's say northern snakehead or, or you know, any other spina hailing species, um, such as uh, flathead catfish, something like that, uh, have so similar to this or even a little less. Um, you know, this, this could be a, a useful model at least to, to understand the patterns that we're seeing. And so let's focus down here. On the on a wet spring. All right, and this past spring has been extremely uh, wet. We've had large rainfall events. Um, the, the most, uh, I don't know if it's the most in decades or not, but we had a we had large uh, runoff events throughout the spring, and so that would be indicative of a of a wet spring. And you can see that at least with blue catfish, um, you see this pattern where most of the bay would be hospitable in terms of salinity tolerance or salinity gradient. Uh, and the further down you go along the eastern shore, down into the bay, even below, let's, this is the Pianka Tank River right here, which is the lower extent that we've seen the fish um, within the tidal rivers. Well, I take that back. I'll show you a slide here in a second. Um, you overlay our coverage. Uh, our, our colonization data and our points here. Um, and so we're looking at you know, salinity gradients and stratification so they could ride the, the salt wedge. Um, likely provides corridors for movement uh, for this fish, um, especially during freshets, uh, which would generally be inhospitable to survival. And so these salinity gradients are likely a driver for the quicker colonization of the Potomac, Rappahannock, and the Pianka Tank Dragon Run. And we just have not seen the fish move much below the, the Pianka Tank River, and I really think it's the salinity barrier. Uh, interestingly enough, just a few weeks ago, we did get a, a verified observation from a professor or, or teacher who, who knew a lot about the species down on one of the beaches in Norfolk. Um, this fish apparently was still somewhat fresh. The gills were moving the first day that he saw it on the beach, um, but then the next day, you know, it was a mortality, and it likely, you know, rode the freshets either from the James, which I'll talk about er in a few minutes, or from the Rappahannock trying to make its way down um, and then succumb to salinity. And so human introductions. The, the other mechanism for dispersal of this fish. And so that's why we're, we're thinking these, uh, these fish are entering our northern Virginia impoundments. There's, there's not really a connection in a lot of these um, small impoundments. And we've seen, you know, greater than 10 small impoundments in northern Virginia in the Potomac, Rappahannock watersheds um, have been illegally stocked. And so as an example up here, uh, Lake Brittle and also 
you know, retention ponds, happy ponds, up, uh, in Victoria Lakes up here in this, this part of the Potomac where we've seen illegal stockings. Uh, the first um, observed uh, observation in the York River drainage occurred at Lake Anna. You know, we had an individual here who took a photo, looked very, I mean, it looked pretty clear it was a snakehead. Our folks went out, did some sampling, didn't find them, but the next year we had an angler catch and then they went back and they did find some juveniles in that same stretch. So, uh, so we have a couple of observations in the York River drainage in Lake Anna. Um, along the eastern shore, uh, this was pretty surprising, but back in 2011, it's kind of an unknown origin fish found on a, a bulkhead in 2011. We chalked it up to maybe it had gotten caught in a crab pot from a, a crab fisherman who was on the opposite end of the shore but came back and just discarded it. Um, we're, we're not sure, uh, but Chad Boyce, our, our local biologist down there, he did find um, these fish have been illegally stocked into an irrigation pond uh, on the eastern shore, which entered into Pungatee Creek. And this was a, a location that was often fished and, uh, and close to a road. Uh, this was concerning. This was uh, in April. Um, first verified two observations of, of northern snakehead in the James River watershed. So we're looking at two water retention reservoirs, Swift Creek and um, Lakeview Reservoir in the Swift Creek watershed. This, these, two, uh, these two lakes run into the Appomattox River, and then, which is very close in proximity to the tidal James. So uh, we're hopeful that they're not you know, proliferating in these, in these systems, and, and hopeful you know, we're not going to see a, a lot show up in the James River watershed, but uh, that was pretty alarming. So why? Why are anglers moving around? Um, taste um, and also bow fishing and traditional angling is becoming more popular. And we have uh, an, a, a, a very adamant uh, bow fisherman who's actually in attendance today who collected all of these fish in, in, a, in one small tidal creek of the Rappahannock River in one night uh, this past spring. So. Um, and so this is what we have for Virginia. <coughs> I'll be looking forward to talking to anyone about um, <coughs> uh, about how this looks in, in the other uh, parts of the watershed. Looking forward to talking to, to Joe more about the Chesapeake Bay in general. Uh, and, and so this is what we have in Virginia. So um, thanks a lot, and I'll take any questions. <coughs> So the question was about the, the fish collected on the eastern shore, uh, or at least observed on the eastern shore. Those are the only two incidences that we have, that we have on record. Um, so, so that's it for now. And, and we're very, um, we're on the lookout. And our biologist down there is, is always looking for, uh, for folks that have information. And, um, and so, yeah, but that's, that's it. That's all we've got. Yes, sir. I know there was a, a young man uh, who, who illegally stocked them into Lake Brittle, um, and uh, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure what happened as far as the. I, th I think the judge caught you know cut him a little bit of a break because uh, he apparently didn't know the potential harm he would cause. So, uh, but there there was one incident that we know of. John. All right. Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's in our yeah it's in our database. It's uh, I mean you could we could 
call it individual creek locations. You know, I'm not going to sit there and and, cons and and if there's a bunch of main stem Rappahannock locations, I'm not including that in the in the cumulative uh, data there. But I mean, you know, they're popping up in a lot of our um, standard monitoring sites. And if there's individual creeks that pop up, then you know that's part of the deal too. Now, if we get if we get multiple hits in one creek, that's not part of that that plot. So. All right, thank you. <laughs> one more question. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, have we seen signs of, of reproduction in the upper, like Rapidan? Uh, he's talking about the, the westerly. No, no sign of reproduction. Um, I guess in the Rapidan, it, it's fairly shallow. It looked like in that picture there was a pretty dense hydrilla bed. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. Um, and I'm not as, I'm not as uh, aware of the Thornton River. Um, Very likely migrate up, is what we're thinking. Yeah, during especially during the spring, during their 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 movement in the spring. So. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Our next uh, presenter um, is Jimmy Barnett, and he comes from Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, and gonna speak to us about the history of snakeheads in Arkansas. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to present. Uh, I'm going to give a little history and, and, and uh, how our distribution is going to Arkansas. So we're jumping across the Mississippi over into the central United States here. So we're, we're changing countries real, or changing parts of the country real big here. Our story began with this fish that's in this picture. This was the fish that was delivered to us by a fish farmer in uh, April of 2008, and this started our saga of, uh, of the snakehead journey. Uh, but really our history goes back a little further than that. Uh, in 2000, one of our fish farmers was approached by a gentleman and asked if he would raise snakeheads for the food fish market and uh, he would be willing to pay this fish farmer six to seven dollars a pound for adult snake, I mean for e eater size snakeheads. And uh, at that time catfish were bringing about a buck, buck fifty a pound and so the fish farmer said, hey, you know, there's a lot, lot more profit here. Uh, so he took some snakeheads in and uh, the journey as it went on there, he had shared those snakeheads with, with a, a couple of other farmers in our, in our area and uh, in 2002, one of our uh, professors at one of our fish health uh, sites reported back to him that, hey, the feds are fixing to list this fish. You know, you need to get rid of what you've got. And uh, so the fish farmer sang his ponds and, and thought he was being diligent and placed the, dead, the, the fish out on the levee that he sang and left them to die. Well, you know, that's, the, that's where the story goes that we didn't know about snakeheads and their ability to, to move a little bit and so basically I think what happened is is uh, on the pond levees these fish wiggled and flopped their way into the bar ditch around his fish farm and uh, that's where they sat. Uh, the Arkansas Game and Fish is an agency in uh, July of 2002 we added them to our fish uh, to our list of prohibited fish to possess and then of course as everybody knows in uh, October of 2002 the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service added them to the injured species list. Uh, this map here is a, is a, shows the state of Arkansas, and the little red spot is all I want you to have your attention on in this map. That's the watershed where this original fish was found. It's not a very big watershed, about 50,000 acres, but that's where we started at there. Those fish that had wiggled into that bar ditch uh, sat there for a long while. We had about four or five years of fairly low water, so they were kind of trapped. In, in that bar ditch around that farm. And uh, then as usual in typical Arkansas weather, we went to our change to the other side of the fence 
and uh, we started having high water, and that's when the, the when the, these fish moved out in, from that bar ditch area into into the uh, watershed where the first one was found at. I, I had this map made just so that I could kind of give you an idea of, of how Arkansas set. If you look at it, basically everything that's blue on here is what is below 185 feet mean sea level. This is fairly common water pattern for Arkansas ever spring. To give you an idea of the extremes though, in 2011, our water level reached 2000 MSL. I mean, not 2,000, 200 MSL. Let me get the 2,000 put the entire state underwater. 200 MSL, okay? So, but even though if, it, if you notice the way Arkansas is made with all of its streams and all their, the, all the streams are highlighted blue also, but basically that entire eastern half of the state is connected together due to agriculture. When, when rice and soybeans came in back in the, in the, in the, or, uh, 1930s and 40s and all in there, agriculture took over and basically they channelized a lot of our ditches and bows and then they added canals so that they could move water around to get it on and off these rice fields. So even when the water is only at, at 185, which is pretty much every year, so much of that is connected because all the, the canals are full and everything so fish can move from one watershed to the other and across and so it, it just really really gives them the pathway to move all over. Uh, there, there's all kinds of habitat that is available for them over there. Uh, you have in the, in the, you have a, just an ag ditch or a canal, and believe it or not, from my experience in fooling with the snakeheads, that's some of their preferred habitat. Even though it doesn't have vegetation in it, it seems like they really like that shallow, muddy, stagnant, set still. A lot of it may be because a lot of our native fishes don't inhabit that very much. Other than spotted gar, you really don't see a lot of other fish in these ditches. Uh, but we have, you know, we have uh, rice fields, we have Tupelo cypress swamps, uh, all those different things. And, and from my experience in Arkansas, those are all preferred habitat for snakehead. So after this fish was brought in in April of 2008, our fisheries biologists went out and started sampling that area. And uh, they used rote nose, they used uh, electrofishing, but basically everything they could throw at them trying to determine where these fish were at. And after a bunch of uh, uh, sampling done all over that area out there, basically it was found that they were really confined to this one watershed, the one that was in red in that first little map that I put up. And uh, so when it was found that they were in this one watershed, we took the approach that, okay, let's eradicate them. We have an opportunity. We have a, a confined population here. Let's get rid of them. And so a uh, plan was put together, and it was labeled Operation Mongoose, and it was supposed to happen uh, in late 2008, but due to a couple of uh, Mother Nature events out there, Hurricanes Ike and Gustav, uh, during the time period that we were going to have the eradication, we had... Uh, uh, not a super high water event, but a high water event big enough to prevent doing an eradication attempt. So after that, Operation Mongoose was rescheduled to the spring of 2009. Mother Nature worked with us that year. We didn't have a sp high spring waters. And uh, so uh, in 2009, in March, we uh, uh, attempted Operation Mongoose. Operation Mongoose went on for about seven days. It, uh, there were uh, over 125 personnel from the Arkansas Game and Fish, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, the University of Central Arkansas, one of our colleges, provided some, some uh, monitoring staff is what they did. They went in and followed up behind the, uh, after we used rotenone as a, as a toxin to kill the fish. And basically, we sterilized that watershed, that entire watershed. Uh, the watershed's 50,000 acres, has about 400 miles of ditches and creeks, about 4,000 acres of sloughs, ponds, and reservoirs. And uh, we know that the uh, students from UCA picked up over 700 individuals that they took back to their lab and did all kinds of, of uh, age and growth and lengths and diets and all kinds of stuff with them. Uh, and uh, we patted ourselves on the back. We thought, hey, man, we've done what, you know, we, we 
eradicated this, this uh, watershed. We use, this is a, a kind of a little more detailed map of the way we did it. We used the incident command system and the operation of that because that many people, you've got to have a, a, a defined system of how to get it all done. And if you look at this map, the green line, when it was originally developed, the green lines were day lines. We started to the north, which is the top, and worked our way south down the watershed. And, uh, and basically, we tried to kill anything that had water in it. I mean, stump holes, uh, tractor ruts. I mean, we, we, we put rope on in places that you probably never even put rope on again. Uh, we used every method you can think of. We used ATVs and also, uh, you know, I, one I didn't, I just thought about today that I didn't put on here. Even though the ATVs were out there, if you couldn't get to it by ATV, we had ground troops that walked to it. Uh, and, and we used powdered and liquid rope known, but we used ATVs. Uh, a lot of that country over there, you can't get a boat around and you can't get an ATV around. So we actually recruited in four Marsh Masters, uh, which basically for you, those of you that ain't been around a Marsh Master, that's a floating bulldozer, it'll go about anywhere. Uh, and uh, we had uh, boats for the regular water. We had uh, boats with a mud motor for the main stem. I was there when we did the eradication. And that's me in the boat in the middle I'm the motor driver of the mud motor, and I covered all 39 miles of the main stem of that thing. If I couldn't boat through it, I winched through it. I got a winch on the front of the boat, a mud motor on the back, and we covered all of it. Just myself and my partner, we put out 1,200 pounds of powdered rope on out of that boat in, in seven days. Uh, and then where we could do all that in bigger areas like Green Tree Reservoirs and all that you can't get around here, we brought a helicopter in, and, and we used liquid rope on it. I mean, we thought we had done just a great, fantastic job. About two weeks, here, here's the fish that we killed on this map here. This shows the, that watershed, and basically, I mean, we had fish, we killed fish all over the watershed. Uh, but basically, about two weeks after our trip, two tributaries east had an angler reporter, snakehead. And, uh, so we thought, well, we've knocked them back, and we did. Uh, basically, from uh, the time of the eradication for about a four or five year period here, we had very few reports. An occasional report here, an occasional report there, but just, so, so we, we did crop them pretty hard at that time, but we weren't perfect. We didn't kill them all. And so I'm gonna go back a little bit, talk about water levels. This, this graph here shows the days of, of uh, the White River being above flood stage. And when I took the correlation of our reports that we have and put it next to this chart, the red line on this, which is the time period April, May, and June, our dispersal pattern since that eradication, that red line of the number of days that the river is above flood stage seems to be a key with when we have big range moves. In 2014, we started getting quite a few reports and, and our reports are, con we do just like everybody else, confirmed reports because we have, we have uh, American Eels, we have Bowfin, we have Spotted Gar, we have uh, sometimes even uh, uh, Things like uh, uh, grass pickerel will show up as, as people think it's a snakehead and all. So we started confirming reports, and this next series of maps I've got here, I'm going to go through them real quick, but basically the little dot shows, you know, in 2014, they're still concentrated mainly right around that original area that we had there. In 2015, we start seeing a little dispersal out as they're starting to gain a little ground and they're, and they're moving out. 2016, they're gaining some more footholds throughout our, our the whole state. That and if basically, if you look at if you remember that first blue map I got, they're just hitting all that water. All that was is underwater. And then in 2017, they did the what we wish they hoped that they wouldn't do, is we had our first reports of, of three fish actually make it into the Mississippi and being on the Mississippi side. So uh, we sent Dennis something to play with down there. Uh, <laughs> so, and then in 2018, uh, again, we're seeing, you know, an increase up so far, 
And the, the other key in here, uh, Dwayne, you can look at this and see, but the one dot I've got way up in the northeast corner of the state, uh, we're fixing to send them to Missouri too. So, uh, so they're getting out everywhere. Here is a, a map that shows our total current distribution that we have around the state that, that, that has all year from 2008 to now. So uh, basically there's still that core area, but you can see the radiating band. I know that the, I, I think uh, the talk, the immediate follow me is going to do a lot better job of explaining that range expansion than I am. So, and with that conclusion, Snakehead, yes, they are established in Arkansas. Uh, these, we've had high water years for the past five years in a row now, and so uh, we're seeing major range expansion. And uh, yes, we have confirmed movement outside of Arkansas. So, with that, I'll take any questions. Yes, ma'am. Was I able to estimate the cost? Yeah, I, I was aiming to tell y'all that. We spent about three quarters of a million dollars on Operation Mongoose. You know, we're not showing near the the question was, what is anger perception? Are they accepted or rejected them or so on and so forth? Uh, we're not seeing near the numbers that, that both of the guys before me have presented. We just don't see a lot. Uh, for instance, in, in 2014, we only had uh, about 13 or 14 fish reported, and it's kind of gradually increased. Now we're running somewhere in the just below 30 annually reported by anglers. Uh, this year, due to some research that's going on in our state, we have collected a whole lot in 2018, but a lot of that is our collections and not necessarily angler reports. Uh, but uh, so they're, they're not, the big thing we're seeing is, is in that core area where they started at, people, all oh, they're there, so they're not telling us. You know, that type, that, and the same thing, you know, you say you don't see all the angler reports out there either. Yes, sir. Uh, in the area of this uh, we've already been talking about this year, but uh, have you been able to find any other species there? At this time, we can't we, 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 we can't say that we're increasing or decli decreasing. Uh, the other funny thing about this whole key that's going to make that question very hard to answer is, is most places we have snakeheads, we now have silver carp. So, you know, what's causing, if we have a decline, what's causing it, the snakehead or the silver carp? Yes, sir. Can you maybe help me like can you see uh, the spring ring out there? Is it like this? We have that traditional picture that I noticed it's in Virginia's book because I looked at their book that they gave us in our restoration packet, but that 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 chart that shows how to tell the difference in a snakehead and a bowfin. Uh, and it is illegal to possess live snakeheads in Arkansas, so if you do catch one you have to kill it immediately. So we're we're that's things that I'm to be investigating now is where do we go, what kind of regulations do we need to apply uh, as they become more abundant and popular. Again, our the question was, is what about the commercial fishing side of it? <clears throat> so far, as far as, have y'all heard of any commercial fishermen? Here's my two snakehead experts down front up here. They're in the heart of the heart of the zone over there. We hadn't had any reports from our commercial fishermen catching them. Uh, it's, the, the, the places that you catch snakeheads, or we have snakeheads, are not the same places people are gonna be commercial fishing. Uh, for Arkansas snakeheads, if you think deep water is 10 inches, anything over that, we don't have snakeheads in hardly. And so that's not places you're going to be commercial fishing. So. Yes, sir. No, we did not. We, we, we basically. 
The question was, is did we take any care with the native fish during Operation Mongoose? And basically, we sterilized that entire watershed. We did have a plan, though, that we went back and, and, and restocked sport fish to give it a boost. And since that is part of a, uh, a, a river system, the, the other fishes would replenish themselves through the normal cycle of, of low and high water. So, but we did go back and put the, the catfish and the bass and the bring them and the crappie back in after, you know, after a time period after we sterilized that watershed. Yes, if they catch it and release it, that is allowed. If they do possess it, it must be dead. Our, our rule says possession of live snakehead prohibited. Yes, sir. They're not, don't appear to. <laughs> Thank you. Next presenter is Shannon Smith, and she comes from the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, and she's going to do some modeling expansion discussion with us uh, for snakeheads in the U.S. All right, thank you, and thank you for allowing me to have the opportunity to come and talk to you all about this. So, um, as mentioned, I'm going to uh, talk about some modeling work that we've done down in Arkansas. Oh, nope, didn't like that. There we go. So, before I get started, though, I just need to thank my collaborators at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff and especially at the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. We've all sort of put our heads together on this and kind of figured out ways to tweak our modeling process, and it's really helped make a better model, I think. <laughs> so I haven't seen this movie yet, but I need to. Um, we could have a viewing with some adult beverages later tonight. But um, as <laughs> as uh, we're all pretty familiar with, uh, these snakeheads do have a lot of the traits of successful invasive species. They are known to spawn multiple times per year. They reach sexual maturity relatively quickly. And as some people have already discussed, they do exhibit a pretty high tolerance of some adverse environmental conditions. As Jimmy said, he did a pretty good job of laying this out. A breeding population was found in Arkansas in 2008, and they've continued to expand their range, as mentioned, across the Mississippi River. So again, we're all kind of familiar with this region now. Um, this is just a map showing where they all started. Uh, that star there, these are our major sort of rivers uh, that they're around. Uh, the Arkansas River, the White River, the Langeal and St. Francis River. And this is their current distribution, um, as Jimmy mentioned as well. So each little triangle is a snakehead location. This doesn't take into account any density. It's just uh, one, one, uh, one snakehead per location here. And so given their current distribution, we really wanted to dig into uh, where are uh, the spatial trends in their expansion, so going year to year, how are they expanding? And also we were wondering if we could get an estimate of the area occupied. Going further, uh, looking into our modeling, we wanted to know where might they go. Uh, can we use where they are now and environmental variables to predict uh, areas that might be more suitable for their expansion? So to do this, we used location data uh, from 2008 to the present, about two months ago was our last location. Uh, we don't have any reports from 2012 or 2013. Um, and these locations were verified citizen reports or reports from state and federal agencies. Any non-verified locations, so a location where a biologist didn't get eyes on it, you know, to confirm that it wasn't a bofin, uh, those locations were not used in our analyses. We grouped locations by year, so we could look at, again, that kind of year-by-year -year expansion pattern. To do this, we used standard deviational ellipses in ArcMap, ArcGIS, and these ellipses encompass about 95% of our location data points, and they allow us to look at both expansion directionality, so are they moving you know, north, south, east, west, and they also uh, allow us to estimate occupied area. So this, these maps are gonna be pretty similar to what Jimmy showed us, uh, but with pretty red circles. And so this is their distribution in 2008. 
2010, 2011, and as you can see, they've pretty much stayed, you know, stayed in that uh, Piney Creek drainage. It's almost like somebody hit the whole area with Rotenone or something. But in 2014, they're starting to move a little bit more. 2015, they made it into the White River. 2016, they made it into the uh, Langille River, and there's one kind of way out to the left here, uh, over there in a bayou. 2017, that was a pretty big movement year for them. That was the year they made it across the Mississippi River. They were found at the Knoxville Lake. And they also made it down into the Arkansas Post Canal, which is out there. Let's see if I can do it on So the Arkansas Post Canal is a navigation canal that connects the White and Arkansas rivers. And so they now, they were found kind of around in the drainages around that canal. So if they chose, they can go into the Arkansas River. Now the Arkansas River does have several lock and dam complexes on it. So we'll see how that, uh, if that slows them down any. But they're, they're knocking at the door. So lastly, 2018. Um, we haven't, again, it's only been a few months in 2018, but we did have that one location up in the St. Francis River, and that's uh, the northernmost that we've found them so far. So looking at these ellipses, we do see sort of this uh, north and south expansion directionality. Obviously, they're following those drainages, uh, but they also have no problem going across drainages. Uh, as Jimmy mentioned, it is, it's flat down there. Um, so anytime there's a little bit of water, uh, spring flows, they c and they get a little bit of water, they just go kind of wherever they want into flooded timber areas, backwaters. Um, so they can, they've been moving around like that as well. So we then use these ellipses to calculate uh, the area they're occupied based on the ellipses. And again, they don't, ellipses don't encompass uh, every data point. That gives us a little bit of a confidence interval. So here's what that looks like. This is area on the y-axis year on the X, and again, reflecting probably the knockdown from Operation Mongoose. So the first four years, uh, not a lot of area expansion based on our ellipses. However, once we get out to 2014, from 2014 to 2017, we see a pretty exponential increase in the, uh, that estimate of area occupied. 2018 so far, it's kind of leveled off. Again, that doesn't, the ellipse, the ellipse, that ellipse didn't take into account the one in the St. Francis River. Uh, so we'll just have to kind of see where they go from here. So using this uh, exponential curve that we fitted to this equation, we kind of wanted to say, okay, well, let's extrapolate this out. In five years, uh, what's that expansion area going to look like? And based solely on that equation, nothing else, it looks something like this. So this dashed red line uh, with the sort of the center of this ellipse on uh, that Piney Creek drainage. Uh, they're going to be up in Missouri, Tennessee, Kentucky, and down in Louisiana, as well as farther into Arkansas and Mississippi. So obviously, they're not going to expand based on that equation. There's a myriad of other factors that's going to impact their expansion. So that's where our modeling came in. And we used a type of species distribution model called maximum entropy modeling, or MACENT. And we used that to sort of try and predict where they were going to go. So we used MACENT for a couple of different reasons. Uh, this software handles presence background data as opposed to presence absence data, and that was a big plus for us. It consistently performs pretty well compared to other species distribution models, and it's recently, uh, through the work of a couple of different people, Muscarella et al., Elif et al., uh, Warren and Seifert, uh, they've been integrating MaxEnt with R, so there's a lot more in-depth model evaluation that we have the power to do now. So what MaxEnt does is it starts with the assumption that your species is uniformly present across a given landscape. It then iteratively, iteratively improves that model fit by maximizing the presence while constraining it by environmental locations or environmental predictors and known occurrence locations. So it's basically fitting a penalized maximum likelihood model. At the end of all that, what you get is a probability of presence for a species based on environmental constraints and known occurrence locations. So again, we have environmental predictors across a landscape of grid cells. Our grid cells uh, for this were 500 meters by 500 meters. That was mostly to save my computer. I actually had to buy new internal hard drives for my computer because of all the computing power and the file size. Um, 
we generate pretty big files, and we average our results over multiple runs. So here's the landscape that we're working with. Um, the blue regions are the landscape that uh, we have in the model. And as you can see, we have part of the southeastern U.S. here. We've got Arkansas and Mississippi, um, and these are based on hydro regions. The USGS hydro regions, uh, that southeast bit is part of hydro region 8 and 11, just encompassing the lower Mississippi. And I also included part of hydro region 2, an area you're all pretty familiar with, the Bay Area. And I included this because this gives, the, this gives us kind of another, another area where these fish are established. Um, so uh, the model kind of knows that, hey, where they are in Arkansas and Mississippi, that's not the limit to their environmental tolerances. Incorporating some of this other data, um, I hope, really strengthens the model and looking, comparing at the model with both of these regions as opposed to just the southeast, um, I believe that it did. So training and testing data for the model did come from both regions. They were just combined, randomly picked and combined. And we ended up with 37 points from the Arkansas and Mississippi region and 73 points from the Bay Area. And there would have been a lot more, um, but we applied a 10 kilometer spatial filter to reduce any spatial autocorrelation. Let's see, uh, we validated the model using five-fold cross-validation, and we randomly picked from uh, bias regions 10,000 background points. And constraining these background points, they were constrained to these bias regions that um, I've been calling them. And those bias regions are just pretty much clustered around the known occurrence location. So the bias region for the southeast is just uh, pretty much right around where they've been found. And the bias region for region two, the Bay Area is pretty much what you see there. It's not much bigger than that. Um, since I was kind of focused on right now predicting uh, the southeast. So we had 10 environmental predictors that we were able to incorporate into this model, the it this iteration of this model. Now that included land cover, elevation, water temperature, precipitation, minimum and maximum air temperature, salinity, density of canals, density of dams, and also a base flow index. And a lot of this data uh, came from uh, USGS stream gauges, um, the NHD uh, V2 plus data set, and the EPA StreamCat data set, which are, which are pretty awesome. Um, and the maps sh shown here are just some examples of those environmental predictors. So that uh, more upper one is uh, elevation, and I, I just think these maps are kind of cool. But that shows the elevation differences, and then the lower one is maximum air temperature, I believe. So um, kind of to optimize and select the best model that we could, uh, we tried uh, 20 candidate models. We ran this analysis in R. And there are a couple of different things that uh, a lot of the literature says you need to look at when doing these MACFEN models to make sure you're not overfitting and to make sure you're actually getting the best model possible with your data. And those things are the regularization multiplier, and you need to test out different values of this multiplier. Uh, this really con this just constrains the predictions to uh, give an interval around the mean. And you also need to look at the feature type. So this feature type defines how those predictions are made. So is it linear, is it quadratic? Uh, there are pairwise interactions between your environmental variables, and so all of these different combinations of these two values kind of, uh, they're really important to how the final model turns out. And finally, the models were evaluated on the sample size corrected AIC statistic, and also on an area under the receiver operator case statistic, or AUC. And that statistic is basically the literal area under the curve of a plot that shows the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. So how, how good is the model at correctly predicting snakehead occurrence? And for the AUC statistic, we use the mean AUC, and we also use the difference between training AUC and testing AUC. So the model with the training data and the model with the testing data. And a lower difference between those two different AUCs is better. That uh, indicates sort of less overfitting. So this is uh, when all is said and done, you get something that looks like this. And I'll just uh, focus on kind of our model parameters right here first before we go into the map too much. But our mean AUC was about 0 0.71, which is, it's all right. Um, a lot of uh, other models like this have higher AUCs. A greater than 80 would be nice, but pretty much anything that's close to 0 0.5, that means that you know your model has no better than random chance at correctly predicting where these species are, so we're doing better than that, which is encouraging. 
we'll keep working on it. But the difference between training and testing AUC was pretty low, which was good. It was the lowest um, out of all the candidate models at 0.60. This did have the lowest uh, uh, corrected AIC as well. And the parameters that made up this model were uh, kings and quadratics. And for just for brevity, I won't go in depth into all of these things, but I'm happy to talk about it uh, with all of you later. And the regularization multiplier that provided this most optim optimal model was to we tested 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 3, and 4. Oops. So looking at the, the map that this model generated here, uh, this is a probability of presence map where 1 in red is a high probability of presence and 0, which is blue, is a low probability of presence. And so you can see obviously where they've been found in Arkansas and Missouri. That's all pretty red. Um, the upper Mississippi, this is the Arkansas River here. And it's it, the blue that you see on the southeast kind of portion of the map, that's the, our mountain ranges, the Boston, Washita, and Ozark Mountains. And so elevation appears to play a pretty big part in this. Another thing that's interesting, uh, down here in Louisiana, there's not a lot of this bright red like we're getting up in Arkansas and Mississippi. Um, that might be a bit of that maximum temperature coming into play. If you remember that maximum temperature map I had up earlier was real, real high temperature down here, and they just haven't been found. They just haven't been found in that type of habitat yet, so the model um, doesn't think that it thinks they're less likely to be there. I'll also point out that a lot of this, um, this kind of intermediate cream kind of color, um, that's a lot of our wetland and crop areas down in the southeast part, so they seem, to, they seem to like that habitat type since we know that they are in our ag ditches and canals and they do appear to like that habitat. So MaxSun also uh, can look at different variable contributions to the model using a jackknifing method. And so the most important variable for this model were land cover. And so that was just classified into open water, wetlands, forests, crops, and I think just uh, developed in general. Um, we haven't, I haven't broken down those just yet. I'm working on that for the next kind of iteration of the model, separating those out and seeing which ones actually are contributing. Um, but didn't have time to do that for this meeting, unfortunately. So the second most important variable, uh, elevation, as we saw in that map, they weren't getting into those higher elevation areas according to the model. Uh, dam density was also pretty important. Uh, minimum and maximum air temperature also shook out as uh, contributing somewhat to the model as well as canal density. The other variables each contributed less than 1% to the model, however. So uh, kind of to wrap things up, uh, we know that they are expanding in Arkansas. They seem to be following those drainages going north and south, but they're also moving across drainages as well. And having kind of worked with this model for a little while now and kind of learning more how it works and seeing what it's doing. I really think that this type of modeling are, uh, combined with sort of expert opinion and informed um, ideas about where these fish can go and are likely to be, this can really, uh, can really help us to predict areas that might be more suitable for snakeheads. And hopefully this can inform any monitoring and eradication efforts, or at least maybe give managers an idea of areas to focus on that might be more susceptible to colonization. So going forward, um, we're going to continue to optimize the model and hopefully include some different environmental predictors. Uh, one thing that the model is lacking is comprehensive in-stream data. Um, I do have water temperature and salinity from USGS stream gauges, which is fantastic, but I'd love to get an idea of the substrate type, um, different in-stream parameters, and that's something that uh, would really be great to incorporate in these models. So, thank you for listening, and I'll take any questions.
So the question was, um, have I been able to use data from China to better inform the model? Um, I have not, I've not looked at that yet. That's been sort of on the horizon. I've been working towards that. I would love to um, talk to those of you here who travel internationally to see if we could kind of work together on that. I think that would really, again, add a whole nother great dimension to the model that is probably lacking. But no, not yet, but I'd love to. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Right, so um, did, I, did I include a precipitation layer or some kind of measure of connectivity? Uh, there was a precipitation layer included. That was, again, from uh, EPA's StreamCat data set, I believe, and it was based on, a lot of these were based on, on catchments, so average precipitation in a catchment. Um, so I did have that in there. I also had a, a base flow index. Um, it's not quite what I wanted to have. I would love to have a better measure of connectivity um, if I could kind of focus or get a better idea of where the low points were connecting watersheds, and if I could focus on that as maybe the mechanisms for getting into different drainages and watersheds, that'd be great. But again, not <laughs> haven't quite gotten there yet, but would love to. So uh, a question about, uh, you mean the, the kind of the landscape right. where I, okay. <laughs> that was, uh, so the talking about the, the landscapes I chose to, to model on, that very straight line was pretty much me clipping the data set so my computer wouldn't die. <laughs> um, <laughs> trying to, trying to keep, uh, keep my computer alive for as much as possible and not have to buy another hard drive. So that was, that was an artificial, that was, that was the user. Um, that was just me saying, well, you know, they're, they're still kind of in the eastern part of Arkansas. Once they get a little bit further west, um, and maybe once I've got my more hard drives now, I can predict, because region, I think that's region eight, that goes yeah, all the way into Oklahoma. Um, so I just sort of said, we'll just do this for now and work, work on the rest later. So there is a uh, question was about uh, incorporating salinity into the model. Um, there is a salinity, there was a salinity layer incorporated in there. Um, I used, again, USGS stream gauges and I, I found some data on the salinity of the Chesapeake Bay. It was, I can't remember where, what website it was from. Um, it might've been from, yeah, I'm not sure. But I, I pretty much, I, I couldn't, I didn't have a good way to encompass the temporal variation in salinity that the bay and the tidal rivers experience, so I pretty much just averaged it across the year. Um, uh, that was sort of my quick and dirty solution to it. Um, since, you know, since Arkansas, we, our salinity, you know, we don't have any, but I tried to incorporate the coastal kind of uh, Louisiana and Mississippi state salinity in there as well. Um, but they're just not, they're just not quite down there yet, so I'm not sure that the model knows what to do with it in that region. Um, but some more comprehensive salinity data would probably be best. And I think um, if we had zoomed into the Chesapeake Bay area, um, I think that might need a little work as well. Because what I, I just had to kind of interpolate it the best I could in ArcGIS. Um, so yeah, salinity would be uh, looking more, more closely into that and uh, temporal variations, you know, seasonal variations in salinity would be good as well. So more work in progress, I'm afraid. All right, that concludes this session. Um, we have a break, and John, you need to help me out on what people can expect from the break. Okay, when you head out the back, when you head out the back, just take a left. Thank you. <laughs>